time, ages uh, fifth grade and below, to their discipleship classes. Uh, if you're new to Keystone, you're a guest today, and you uh, have not yet checked your kids in for the, those classes, but you'd like them to participate, just slip to the back of the room, and uh, one of our volunteers will gladly uh, help you get checked in and signed up so that they can participate. Uh, so good to be together on the Lord's Day, and especially a day like today. Uh, props to you for braving the threat of this incoming storm. You guys are like the most spiritual people at Keystone. You do know that, right? Way more spiritual than the live streamers. Uh, no, not true. Uh, not true. We love you too, live stream, but um, I do f- kind of feel like I'm sitting with the spiritual elite today. Um, you know, in the, gr- in the words of the great Batman, you know what Batman said? Uh, fear says to the warrior, there's a storm coming. But the warrior says back to fear, I am the storm, right? That's you today. You, you are the storm, and you're here. So uh, we'll just trust God uh, for whatever the, the rest of this day holds. But I uh, guess I'll just add my word of welcome to what was already said. We're so glad you're here with us. We hope it's a wonderful day uh, with, with God's people here at Keystone, and uh, that you really sense the Lord's presence among us and his love uh, being, being communicated to you liberally and generously. Um, live streamers, get your Bibles out, get out of bed, get that coffee going, and you focus as well. We've saved you a lot of seats today, plenty of room for you next week. So come on back, and uh, we'd love to see you in person. Uh, if you don't have a Bible today, and it's because you don't own one, we'd actually love to give you one. Um, there's, some, there's some copies out of the, out of the, uh, in the lobby at the Connection Center, and so we're going to open our Bibles in just a minute. But if you don't have one, don't feel bad about that. Just use your electronic device, and then make sure you pick one up. Uh, on the way home today. But let's go ahead and get those Bibles open to the book of Exodus. Uh, We're continuing our line-by-line, paragraph-by-paragraph expositional study through this entire book of the Bible, and today's installment is going to come from chapter 12, Exodus 12, verses 14 to 28. And as you're turning, uh, let me just, let me just acknowledge that, um, you know, some of us have a problem with forgetting things, don't we? You ever forget things? And uh, forgetfulness can be a problem, you know, we all suffer from the effects of time. Now, thankfully, most of the time, for, for the majority of us in here, the things that we forget probably have very little uh, significance in the big picture. You know, maybe, uh, maybe they're a bit of an inconvenience, like, like, oh, man, I forgot my password again. Anybody ever do that? Like, you can't remember the password to log into that account? Um, you know, or, or, or great, I can't remember where I parked the car. Uh, that happened to me just last week. I was coming out of Publix, and I was like, where did I park the car? You know, so you sort of wa- wander around aimlessly. One time, me and my wife actually did that in an amusement park, uh, parking lot, you know, at the end of a long day, and it's pouring down rain, no umbrella, not one of my finer moments, <laughs> but nonetheless, I am happy to report I did find the car eventually, like an hour later. Um, believe it or not, it was right where I left it. Imagine that. Um, sometimes our forgetfulness can actually get us into trouble, though, can it? Uh, like students, I forgot the homework assignment was due today. Oh, no, right? Uh, I forgot to study for the test. I forgot to set the alarm this morning. I, I forgot that bill was due. Last week, you know, like forgetfulness can get us in trouble. Sometimes it can be unner- unnerving. You know, I forgot where I put my wallet. I lost my credit card. I can't remember where I put it. I, I can't find my car keys. I, it can be pretty unnerving. Other times forgetting can be painful. You know, we probably all know someone who is suffering with the effects of Alzheimer's or dementia. And that's quite painful, isn't it? It can be devastating for everyone who knows that loved one when when that person starts to forget the very faces of the people that they love and can't even recall their own memories that, they, that have played out over the course of their lifetimes. So forgetfulness can actually have a myriad of different effects, but here's what I want us to think about today. Spiritual forgetfulness can actually be the most devastating version of all, which is precisely why we have this passage before us in Exodus chapter 12, because God knows our thoughts and because God knows that uh, we are prone to forgetting things. He knew that Israel would, would be prone to forgetting things. He knew that his people of all ages, of all times, are forgetful. And so he laid out a very detailed plan here uh, for us and for them to be in a position constantly of being reminded of some truths that are critical for us not ever to forget. And so just to catch you up a little bit, last week we learned about the Passover, right? Zach, Zach mentioned that earlier. And Yahweh is getting his people ready for the 10th and final plague on the nation of Egypt. It's coming soon. The plague that's going to bring death to all the firstborn in Egypt. And we learned last week that Israel actually stands under the same threat of that same plague as the Egyptians, if not for the substitute sacrifice that God has said could be made in their place. 
And what was that sacrifice? A spotless lamb could be a substitute for the sinner, right? God said it very clearly. Look up at verse 13. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So on Passover night, one of two things is absolutely going to take place. Either a lamb's going to die or a person's going to die, right? One or the other. That's what's coming. No exceptions. And so with that in mind, follow along, please, in verse 14 as I read God's holy and inspired words that he spoke to Moses. I'm calling today's sermon Redemption Response. And in Exodus 12, 15, On the first day, you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, you shall hold a holy assembly. And on the seventh day, a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought, you, uh, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the, Lord, or then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. These are God's words for Keystone Bible Church today. Let's ask the Spirit to help us learn them well so that we'll be equipped to to live them out well in the week ahead. Here's the big idea that sits over top of our passage. And so if you're a note taker, and I hope you are, then go ahead and write this uh, first statement down as sort of the summary statement of of this whole text of Scripture. God's redemption calls for my response. God's redemption calls for my response. All right? God is about to rescue and redeem his people from bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt. And unless they forget what will take place on this night, at some point in the future, you know, what he's going to accomplish in order to bring about their redemption, he's going to call them to respond to this redemption plan in three very specific ways. And these are the same three ways that you and I are called to respond to God's redemption in our lives. If you've been saved and delivered from the power and the presence of sin... These are three critical choices that God is calling every single one of us to make today. Three responses to redemption. You ready? Here's the first one. In response to God's great redemption, I choose.
Isn't it true that as the people of God, we are prone to forget really important things? Right? We, we just have such spiritual short attention spans and short memories, like we have short-term memory loss or something, right? In fact, one church historian describes the Christian life like this. He says, the Christian life is a combination of amnesia and deja vu. He's saying that a lot of our Christian lives are like, like you know what, I've learned this lesson before. I know I've been taught this before, and I know I should have known before. I should have known better. But the truth is I forgot, right? I did the same thing again. Sounds about right. Sounds like us, because how many times have we learned that worry is worthless and trusting the Lord is infinitely better? And yet, what do we do when a storm comes, right? What are we still prone to do? We're, we're still prone to give ourselves over to worry and fear rather than to trust in the Lord. And so the Lord has to come and remind us over and over again, because we have this issue with spiritual forget, forgetfulness. How many times have we learned the lesson that you cannot defeat sin with willpower alone, that you have to have gospel grace. And the, that's the only way to victory, by applying the gospel and living it out every single day. And yet, how many times do we forget how much we need grace and forget to rehearse the gospel in our lives and then wonder why we are so routinely defeated by sin? And yet we are forgetful, aren't we? We're just like that quote that I quoted earlier, we, we experience deja vu. We're right back at the same place over and over again. We're right back to falling for the same old temptation, even though we know better. Right back at ground zero, having forgotten that we have no power to overcome sin on our own, but we are in desperate need to depend on the Lord and his grace in all things if we're going to find uh, what we need for, for that to be sufficient in our, in our lives. We have to remember to trust the Lord, which is something that we had to learn in our very first moment as a Christian, isn't it? You can't be a Christian and not initially understand this. To become a Christian is to place your faith in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your eternal soul and body. But for some reason, after understanding our desperate need for the grace of God initially to save us eternally, for some reason, we then struggle to remember that the same way we were saved from our greatest crisis of eternity is the same way and the only way we will ever be saved from every other subsequent crisis that we're going to face in our lives. I am a great sinner, and I am in, a, I am in need of a great Savior, and Jesus is the only one who has the power to save me from this desperate condition. And all that's required of me is to receive his grace, is faith, to believe in who he is and what he says, that he will do what he says he will do. What I'm saying is that that's not just how you get saved uh, by the gospel power to, you know, rise ultimately from death and be saved for, from sin for all eternity. I'm saying that, that, that you are also saved from every other remaining sin in your life through that same gospel means. That's what we have to remember. We must remember the gospel, the reality that the gospel gives us the answer for every evil that we face. We must not forget the power of the gospel. We must not fail to remember the grace available to us in the gospel through Jesus Christ alone. And that's why we have to rehearse these gospel truths over and over again and recount the many ways in which God has worked for the benefit of his people for centuries and for millennia and specifically in each of our lives throughout the days of our lifetimes, right? Individually. This is why it's such a beneficial thing to get in the habit of journaling the works of God that have taken place in your lifetime so that you will not forget. You're going to need to review those things at various points in your life. This is why it's also important as a church family to not forget the, the goodness and the works of God for us collectively as a church here at Keystone. We need to regularly rehearse the works of God that he's accomplished for us throughout our history, his grace, his faithfulness to shape us into the church that we are today. In fact, I don't, I don't know how many of you had today's date marked on your calendar, but do you know that August 4th is actually a very significant day in the life of our church? Raise your hand if you know what happened on August 4th. Anybody? Hold them up. Let me see. Who knows? All right. So now we're, we're kind of whittling the elite group down to the, like the, the special forces group, right? <laughs> I saw three hands. 17 years ago today, God led a church planner from Michigan to our little town of Odessa, Florida with a burden to replant and revitalize a small group of people who had a desire to establish a healthy church in this community. All right, now Keystone is actually 46 years old. It began in the living room of Bruce and Yvonne.
many wonderful years of ministry and gospel testimony in this community prior to 2006. But in 2006, all that remained of that 30-year history that had gone before was a group of 12 people who were struggling to keep the doors open, seriously contemplating, you know, shutting down the, the functions of the church forever. And it was at that time that God was pleased to show up and to revitalize that dying church into what we have been able to experience and enjoy together for the last 17 years. It was actually on uh, January 21st of 2007 when the surrounding community here in Odessa was invited to come to the grand reopening of Keystone Bible Church to see what God was doing to build his church here. This is a picture of the little invite card that was mailed to all the surrounding neighborhoods uh, around Keystone. Here's a picture that was taken on that first Sunday on the grand opening. And uh, during those years, we, we met in a different building than we do now. It's still right down the road from us. Here's what the outside of that building looked like back then. Um, here's a picture of the inside of us worshiping together inside of that ministry center. And uh, here's what it looks like now. We sold it to Millennium Landscape back in 2016, still right down the road. And after that building, many of us here today will probably remember meeting together at Keystone Prep Gymnasium over on Gun Highway for five whole years. We went there saying things like, this is probably a six-month stay, maybe a year at most. Five years later, from 2012 to 2017, the Lord led us out. But here's a picture of us worshiping as a church family during the gym years. And we praise God for all that he did in our midst during that season of time. And we also praise him for providing this facility in 2018. Here's some, some more recent pictures of us worshiping together here. What a joy it's been to have a place that we can call home, a building where we can put down our roots in this community. And we praise him that he's not only using uh, us to build a healthy church here in the, in the you know, city of Odessa, but he's also used us to reproduce other churches through us, locally, regionally, nationally, globally, like we're part of church planning all over the world. For example, in 2013, God allowed us to, allowed us to help another struggling church in Holiday, Florida, and uh, through those efforts, Holiday Bible Church was launched in 2015. And we praise God for using us to establish another healthy community of faith in, in that area of, of Tampa Bay. And then in 2019, he allowed us to come alongside another struggling church in Wesley Chapel that has been revitalized and reshaped as Keystone Bible Church Wesley Chapel, our sister congregation. And in addition to those two local regional efforts to reproduce ourselves, we've also been actively involved in many other church planning initiatives, some in other parts of this country, but many of them all over the world. And so what a blessing it is to remember the works of God at Keystone, amen? We must not ever forget them, loved ones. Keystone Bible Church stands here today as a lasting testimony of what God can do to build His church. It is not the work or the legacy of any man. It is the work of God himself who is keeping his Matthew 16 promise to build his church and to not allow the gates of hell to prevail against it. We must remember this. We must not forget where we've come from. We must not ever stop recalling what we've seen God accomplish in our midst. He has always been faithful, even through very difficult seasons, and he always will be, loved ones. He can always be trusted, even in times of darkness, even in times of confusion, even in times of want and need. Our God can be trusted. And I think this is also one of the reasons that we should regularly share the gospel with other people. It's one of the reasons that we should each be involved in the, the life of the church, specifically in small group communities like life groups, because it's in those small communities where we are living in accountable life-on-life -life relationships that we have the regular opportunity to retell the goodness of God that is being accomplished in each of our lives. We need that. We need to hear what God's doing in one another's lives. It builds up both the teller and the hearer. And sometimes it even results in the opportunity to share the gospel with people who have not yet received it. This is why in verse number 26, it says this, when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he has passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. See, rehearsing what God has done stirs up the hearts of believers to praise him, but it also piques the curiosity of the lost who have not yet received him. It gives us an open door to share the gospel with them. In fact, I think that's one of the absolute best ways to share the gospel with other people. Just simply tell them your story. Just tell them what God has done for you and what he's doing now for you. Let them, let them know that he can and will do the same for them. 
You, you say, but I don't have an incredible story like Israel about God, you know, parting the waters of the Red Sea to, to reach out and save me. I don't have a really awesome testimony like I hear some people tell, like how God saved me from some horrible, you know, lifestyle of, of debauched sin and depravity. My story isn't very impressive. Brother or sister, let me ask you a question. Are you a Christian today? Has Christ saved your soul by his mercy? Has he cleansed you from all unrighteousness and written down your name in his book of life? Has he purified you with his own spilled blood on the cross of Calvary? Are you not an undeserving child of God? If your answer is yes to any of those questions, then listen to me very carefully. You are a living, breathing miracle. You are a trophy of grace and a living testimony to the God who works wonders. And I would argue that no matter the details of your specific story, your, how your transformation took place, those are the absolute best stories and the most compelling ones in all of the world. Those are the stories that we need to rehearse the most. Because just like Israel, we must remember the salvation work of our God. We must remember the gospel. Now, you'll recall from last week that all this imagery of the Passover, of slaughtering the lamb and putting the blood on the doorposts, it's all intended to be a precursor and a forecasting of the ultimate lamb of God who would one day be slain at, at Passover to take away the sins of the world, right? We covered that in great detail last week. And a lot of those same details get repeated here for us again in uh, verse number 21 of today's text. So I'm not going to go through all that in detail again. But notice in verse 21, Moses goes back to the elders of Israel and he, he basically says, this is what God's told us to do. You need to go get a perfect lamb. You, need, lamb. you need to kill it for Passover. You need to take the hyssop. You need to dip that in blood. You need to touch the lentil uh, and the doorpost with that blood. And then on Passover night, none of you better leave your house. You better stay inside because God is going to come through the area tonight and he's going to destroy the firstborn in every house that has not been covered with the lamb's blood. This is what God wanted his people to remember, that salvation comes through the shed blood of the lamb. And that's why God made a yearly festival to commemorate that fact, so that his people would remember what they should never forget, right? And just like them, we must also recount on a regular basis that our salvation, our redemption comes through nothing else than the shed blood of God's spotless lamb. Now, maybe you're wondering, why don't we still regularly celebrate the Passover, like this exact meal, just, you know, just like the Old Testament people did. Why don't we do that in our day? Here's why. Because Jesus replaced it by his own self-sacrifice. I want you to think about this. Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, celebrated this same meal with his disciples in the upper room. He asked them to come together, and, and he said to them, let's celebrate the Passover tonight. And so they all got together in a room, and uh, he sat down among them, and these guys would have, you know, they would have celebrated the Passover many, many times before. They, they knew exactly what to expect. Like, this was all scripted out in great detail. But much to their surprise, when Jesus stood up to begin the meal, you know, he's standing there as the presider over the meal, and there were two enormous shocks. Shock number one, the presider would always uh, explain, you know, the elements of what was going to be visualized before them in the various symbolisms of that meal. And, uh, and that was his job. And so Jesus standing as the presider, it, it was almost like a memorized script. Like they knew what was coming. They expected him to give these very details that are before us in Exodus 12 and 13. In fact, specifically, they expected to hear him say, this is the bread of our affliction. Referring back to the affliction of their Jewish ancestors who suffered greatly in Egypt under Pharaoh's hand, and then suffered out in the wilderness. That's what every presider of the Passover had said for centuries. This is the bread of our affliction. But guess what? That's not what Jesus said, is it? Instead, he holds up the bread, and what does he say? This is my body. Blasphemous to the Jews. This bread is my body. What he was saying is, this bread is my affliction, that I am going to suffer I am going to give it to you. I'm going to give ultimate freedom for, for, to you. Freedom not just from physical or political or economic bondage like in Egypt, but from sin and death itself. So that's the first shock when he said, this is my body. I mean, their jaws had to hit the ground for the presider to, to deviate from the plan. And then the, here's the second, even bigger shock. Shock when he, when he stood up there uh, and, he, and he called them um, to, to, to move forward with the, with the symbolism his head was up, but the disciples' head was down. 
Because there were three things that we were always supposed to have at a Passover meal. You're supposed to have unleavened bread. We're going to talk a lot about that in just a minute. And then you're supposed to have four different cups of wine. And then you're supposed to have a lamb, right? Well, Matthew 26 clearly records that the unleavened bread was there. Jesus broke the bread with the disciples, right? And, and it also reports that Jesus was drinking from the cup with them. So the wine was there as well. But guess what? There's absolutely no reference to a lamb. And so the disciples had to be thinking, what kind of Passover is this, right? There's no lamb at the table. That's the whole point of the Passover. Why is that? Because the lamb was at the table. There was no lamb on the table because the lamb was seated at the table. Jesus deliberately removed the lamb from the Passover meal. And in doing so, he was making a shocking statement. I am the lamb, right? Tonight on the cross, I will die as a substitute, as the sacrificial lamb of God. He was making it clear that his death would bring the ultimate salvation that Moses had foretold of and that the Passover was always pointing to. This is why we as believers living today celebrate the Lord's Supper together, not the Passover. We eat the lamb together as a church family. We remember and testify together that Jesus is our Passover lamb. That his sacrifice was in our place and it provided ultimate freedom, not just from slavery in the world, but from slavery to sin forever. We eat the bread representing his body and we drink the cup representing his blood as our reminders that no other lamb will ever be necessary again. Amen? In John chapter 6 verse 54, Jesus said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. And you know what? When Jesus said that, a whole lot of people left Jesus that day. There were a whole lot of people that were very offended by that statement. All of a sudden, the crowd of people, his crowd of followers, it got a lot smaller. Some because they probably misunderstood what he was actually saying. But, but others because they knew exactly what he was saying. They knew the analogy. He was making it clear that in the same way that the Hebrews in Egypt had to shed the lamb's blood and eat the lamb's body as a sign that they were consecrated to the Lord, so we are to eat of the lamb as a sign that we've been consecrated to the Lord, that we belong to him. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am your way in. I'm the only way in. The way of salvation, the way of consecration, the way of belonging to the Lord is no longer through the sacrifice of little lambs. It's no longer through the blood of goats. It's through the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb. And whoever participates in that blood and in that sacrifice by faith is cleansed forever and is made whole. If we're going to escape destruction, this is the way. We must accept the substitute of the Passover lamb. We must receive Jesus. We must, by faith, accept his body and his blood in our place. And isn't this so much more substantive than the way we often hear salvation talked about in our day? Like, isn't this so much more substantive than just saying, hey, you know, just pray a prayer. Or or just repeat repeat these words after me. Or, or, you know, just ask Jesus to come into your heart. Listen, I don't want to, like, unnecessarily undermine anybody's own personal gospel presentation, but but just hear me. Asking Jesus to come into your heart is not what salvation is. That's what salvation does, right? Jesus coming into someone's heart is the effect of salvation. But we are told in the New Testament that salvation comes through one means, not by asking Jesus to come into your heart, but by repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus. And what are we supposed to believe? We're supposed to believe that Christ is our Passover lamb, that he's our substitute, that he is our cleansing That he died where we should have died. So as a result, repent of your ways, right? Repent of your sin. And put your full confidence and trust in him alone. Because if you do, you will be saved. God's redemption calls for my response. And the first response I make is to choose to remember what I should never forget. I must never stop remembering the gospel of Jesus and the goodness of God that has been lavished upon me. Here's the second one. I must also choose to eradicate what I should never keep. There's another part of the Passover feast that I think often gets overlooked here. Starting in verse number 15 and going all the way down to verse 20, there's this seven-day festival that gets described. It's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's connected to the Passover, but I want you to know that it's also distinct as well. The festival actually begins with the Passover meal in the evening of the Passover. 
And at that time, Israel was supposed to eliminate all the leaven from everywhere in their home. We just read about that, right? Between the 14th and the 21st day of the month of Nisan. So, so it's not just that they were uh, supposed to slaughter the lamb and you know, eat it on a single night. They were also supposed to observe this ongoing aspect of the Passover called the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. So again, Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, they're, they're, they are not completely separate events, but they do have distinct emphases, okay? As a matter of fact, Passover will eventually come to refer to the entire week throughout Israel's history, not just specifically to the Passover meal. And they took this Feast of Unleavened Bread part really, really seriously. In fact, I came across a An old Jewish book written somewhere around the 13th or 14th centuries. It was written in ancient Italy by some Jews that had colonized there. And, you know, the book gives some explanations um, specifically to the question, how are we supposed to perform the Passover? Referring especially to the ongoing elements throughout the whole week, the Feast of the Unleavened, uh, Unleavened Bread. What are we supposed to do with the leavened bread that may be in our homes? Listen to how seriously they took this. Here are a few things the book detailed. There was a search that was supposed to begin the sundown, at sundown on the 14th of Passover. You were to conduct the search for leaven all throughout your house by candlelight so that every hidden corner could be properly illuminated. And then you're supposed to have a very light feather on hand as well. And you're supposed to use the feather to like, go into these tight little corners of your home, the cracks and the crannies, right? And, and brush them out to be sure that no leavened crumb might have accidentally fallen to the ground and you know, rolled over into there. Every little crumb had to be accounted for. And before you would even begin the search, you, you, you would gather your candle, you get your feather, but, but there would be a blessing that would be spoken over this whole time. And the blessing would be pronounced by the head of the household. And it was this, quote, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us concerning the removal of hametz. Hametz is the name for any leavened product in your household. And once that blessing had been recited, nobody else from that point forward was allowed to do any other work except look for hametz. You were not permitted to eat. You were not permitted to talk to each other unless your conversation had to do with finding hametz. And every room had to be searched. Even your yard had to be searched. Now, I don't know why. Like, why are they out in the yard, right? Uh, I don't know if it was like they had unruly dogs or, you know, maybe this is a reference to wells. Some, Some people think that. But you had to go out there in your yard and literally look in every hole with your, with your candle and your feather to find any leavened products. The book goes on to say that once the search had been conducted throughout the whole house and over the whole grounds and every nook and cranny had been inspected with this tiny feather, then after the search, you would come back inside and every single person would recite this statement together. It was sort of like an oath. Any hemets that is in my possession... And that I have not seen, that I have not observed, that I have not removed, and that I do not know about, shall hereby be annulled and shall become ownerless like the dust of the earth. In other words, I've done everything I can do. I've done my best. And if there's any more hamets, any more leavened products anywhere around here, I cannot be held responsible because I've done all I can do. Right? And that was found. Whatever they did find, they had to burn it. And if there was, you know, enough... Uh, of this stuff that the people actually wanted to keep it afterwards, like they wanted to go back and start eating it again, you were allowed to sell it to your non-Jewish neighbors. And then after Passover, you could go back to them and you could buy it back at a price. You can imagine that turned into a really profitable thing for the neighbors, right? As they would mark those prices up. But if anything came up lost or missing during the, the, the search, like, like there's, a, there's a piece of bread missing, right? You would have to go find it. You'd have to pile it up. You'd have to get it on the table. You'd have to get rid of it. And And get this, the book says, even if a mouse happened to come in and grab a crumb and run off, you'd have to start the search all over again to find that lost piece of hametz that has escaped in your property. The point is, they took this very, very seriously. And I think that begs an obvious question. It probably begs a lot of questions, actually. But the main question would be this, what is so bad about leaven, right? I mean, is this God's way of telling us that carbs are bad and we should all be on keto? Should we all be gluten-free? Is, that, is this like a biblical diet here? No. Remember, as we said last week, that one of the reasons for leaving out the leaven initially was simply because of the urgency that w- of this moment, like what was taking place. They had to be ready to leave very, very soon. The exodus was coming, right? So there wasn't time to wait around for bread to rise. 
And, and, and so I should probably just comment, for those of you who are, are thinking, what is leaven anyway? Like, I don't even know what we're talking about right now. So for all the non-bakers, which I'd put myself in that category, leaven is a rising agent. It, it's what you put in uh, bread dough that makes it rise and makes it all fluffy and nice, right? It's, it's what makes bread taste good. And, and we could get into all the technicalities of that, like the fermentation process and how the yeast ferments and creates carbon dioxide, which makes these little bubbles in there and makes it rise. But the point of that is that the process takes time. It's not fast. And in Exodus 12, the Hebrews didn't have any time to wait. But I mean, come on, like this, this has to be about more than just time, right? I mean, the, the degree to which they took this seriously and, and that it ended up, you know, being so significant for centuries to come. It can't just be about urgency of time. I mean, four different times here, look, they're told they should not eat leavened bread, right? No, eat only unleavened bread. Two other times they're told that they cannot have any leavened food products in their house. Two more times they're told that anyone who does not abide by these rules and does not get rid of every single leavened product in their household will be completely cut off from the nation of Israel. So these are pretty high stakes. So we're definitely not just talking about, you know, if, you, if you'd give leaven a break, you might put, uh, take a few pounds off. Like this is not a diet thing. This is, a, if you don't get rid of that you're going to be excommunicated. You're kicked out of the family. You're no longer welcome here. So whatever this is has to be a lot more than, hey, we're just in a big hurry, so we don't have time for leaven. And there is something more, something much, much more serious. You see, leaven throughout the entire Bible has kind of a sinister association more often than not. Most often it's used as a picture specifically of the corrupting nature of sin. And it's a pretty good picture, isn't it? Because it, again, for those of you who are, are bakers, you, you know how this works. You take that lump of dough, you, you, you get your yeast packet, you put the yeast in there, you start stirring it and working it all around, right? You massage it through uh, all parts of that dough. And what happens? As, it, as the dough sits there on its own, it just magically starts to expand and it will work its way into every nook and cranny of that, of that lump of dough. Eventually, its influence will be felt through the entire lump. And this is exactly how sin operates in our lives, is it not? It grows. It spreads. Sin is not content with occupying just a little corner of your life, brother or sister. It does not want to be restricted to a, a back hall closet in your heart. It wants to move out and to spread into the kitchen and into the living room and into the bedroom until it has taken over every aspect of your life. And if you do not remove it, that's what's going to happen. That's what sin does. It grows. It spreads. It corrupts. Its influence will creep into every corner of your heart. This is why Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. See, it has a corrupting influence. And that corrupting influence tends to spread. This is why in Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, Paul writes and says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. In that context, he's specifically warning about legalism and self-righteousness. He's saying, if you let a little bit of that stuff in to your life, into your family, into your church, it's, gonna, it's not going to just stay in the background. It's going to creep into every aspect, every facet of your life and ministry eventually. Listen, you let a little bit of sexual sin in, before you know it, it will start to spread to, to where it takes over your thinking. And it will occupy more and more of your attention until you cannot put it down. It will demand more and more from you until it takes everything from you. You let a little doubt in. That doubt is going to begin to grow and to spread. And before you know it, you're going to have a whole crisis of faith on your hands. This is how leaven works. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes and says, your boasting is not good. He's talking to a church family where there's been egregious sin in the lives of some of the people. But the church isn't doing anything about it. They're just like letting it happen. They're just carrying on and covering it up, pretending like everything's okay over here, right? They're sort of even boasting about the fact that they're really tolerant, you know? We're really loving. We're grace-filled. Like, look how kind we are. Look how compassionate we are towards sinners. Look how forgiving we are. And Paul's like, right? Hogwash. Your boasting is not good. Look, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's a couple of things I want to highlight there. First, notice there's this corporate danger with the presence of sin. Do you see it? In other words, sin left unchecked does not just corrupt my heart. 
The sin that I'm harboring in my life, that I'm boasting of, that I'm excusing, that I'm minimalizing, guess what? It's going to grow. And many times, it's going to grow beyond me to the point where it will inevitably hurt and influence and affect other people in my church, in my marriage, in my family, in my life. There's a serious danger of the sinful corruption spreading. It's like a contagion. Which is why Paul, like, in order to, he tells us, like, to, we're, we're to contain it. We're, we're to prevent it from infecting everybody. And so how do you do that? You've got to be, as a church, committed to church discipline, he says in another passage. You've got to deal with sin. The danger is too real. You can't let it fester. The corruption of sin will spread. It will infect eventually the whole church family. See, sin is dangerous. But also notice, sin's power in us. I love how he, he, he says, but you are unleavened, Right? Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. His death has been made, he made it possible for us to already be a new unleavened, unsoiled lump. That's why we have the ability to cleanse out the old sinful leaven, right? He's arguing for the fact that as believers in Christ, we are to purge sin from our lives every day by confessing it and repenting of it and forsaking it. But we are living in the reality of what we have already been made to be in Jesus Christ. We are proving that we are the real deal when we take sin seriously. We're we're saying we really are unleavened, right? It's interesting to me that Paul calls calls this a new lump. You see that? Because a new lump in their day would have had no leaven in it. You probably need to know that the way people in Paul's day would have have leavened bread from from one baking experience to the next is very different from ours. They, They didn't have the ability, obviously, to go down to Publix and be like, we're going to make some bread today, so let's, let's buy a packet of yeast, right? Take that home, stick it in the, in, in the, that's typically what happens today. Like, I doubt many of you are making your own yeast. You're probably getting the yeast from somewhere if you're making bread. But not in ancient times. The, the way that you leavened bread back then is you would keep a little bit, a little portion of the dough from today's baking, and you would save it so that the next time you, you needed dough and you wanted to leaven, leaven the bread, you could, you could take that previously leavened piece And you could merge it with the new dough and work it in in such a way that it would leaven that whole new lump. And so the point is this. That's exactly what the Lord did not want Israel to do. He did not want them to take any of the sin and the immorality and the idolatry that characterized their lives in Egypt with them. He didn't want them to bring any of that leaven with them into this new season of time after the Exodus. It was going to be a new day. They were a new community. They were a new people marked out as the people of God. And as such, they were to leave Egypt behind and start out as a new unleavened holy lump, to to use the analogy here. Why? Because the Lord knew that any little part of the Egyptian religious system and lifestyle that they would carry out with them across the desert would eventually grow in their lives and in their community, and it would spread into everything eventually and, and, and take them away from him. See, again, friends, that's what sin does. It's corrupting. Left unchecked, its influence will work into every part of your life. It'll work its way through a country, through a society, through a whole family, through a whole church. That's why the Lord set up this feast for seven days, to be the constant reminder that his people need to root out every remaining evidence of sinful leaven and clean up the house wherever sin has started to take effect. And it's also a reminder that sanctification is not optional for the believer. Philip Ryken, in his commentary on Exodus, says this regarding the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He says, God wanted to do something more than get his people out of Egypt. He wanted to get Egypt out of his people. Isn't that good? That's exactly right. Sanctification is not optional. Growing in Christ's likeness is not optional. Pursuing holiness is not optional for the believer. Allowing sin to reside in my heart is not permittable. Listen, the Lord did not just save you to keep you out of hell, okay? He saved you to sanctify you. He rescued you from slavery to sin and made you his son and da- or daughter. Sons and daughters of a holy God, right? And as such, 1 Peter 1.15, as he who has called you is holy, you are to also be holy in all of your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And listen to me, the pursuit of holiness, personal holiness, That is not going to end at any point in your life as a believer. This is something you must pursue every day. It's the constant pursuit of every single one of us who name the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. By the way, I think this is 
probably why there was this addition at the feast of bitter herbs. It doesn't get mentioned in this passage, but it was mentioned last week. If you look up at verse 8, it says you're going to make this meal, you're going to eat the unleavened bread, but you're also going to eat bitter herbs with it, right? So because of that, a lot of Seder plates, uh, when the Passover is celebrated today and throughout Jewish tradition, they'll, they'll, they'll serve some kind of bitter herbs. Often it's horseradish or some kind of bitter leaf that will be on the plate. Why? Why bitter herbs? If you go all the way back to the uh, book of Exodus chapter 1, the beginning of the book, verse 14, it says that Pharaoh made their lives bitter with hard service. So the bitter herbs were to remind them of just how bad sin really was. And why would God need to remind them of that? Because we have a way of forgetting that, don't we? We have a way of glamorizing sin in our lives. We, We have a way of glamorizing it all throughout our society. Like every commercial on TV in one way or another seems to be portraying this false delusion that a life without God and his holy restraints on your life is a great life. But it's a lie, loved ones. And if we're not careful, that will start to influence us. I mean, Israel will only be gone from from Egypt for like a few days and they'll, they'll already be saying crazy things like, we remember the fish that we had in Egypt, right? We remember the cucumbers and the melons and the and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic, right? If you've been tracking with their story, you're like, what are you talking about? You were slaves in bitter service to Pharaoh in Egypt. That's who you were. You weren't grazing at a cucumber buffet, right? You were serving melons to the Egyptians. You weren't living high on the hog yourself back in Egypt. You were abused. Do I need to remind you of that? Your children were murdered, Have you forgotten, Israel, what you said in Exodus 6, 9, that your spirits were broken because of the harsh slavery in Egypt? But see, that's what sin does. It's it's this allurement, right? In their minds on the other side of Exodus, they, they somehow convinced themselves that Egypt was the good old days before God and this crazy Moses guy dragged them out in this miserable desert. See, sin has a way of worming itself back into the desires of our hearts, doesn't it? Things that were devastating and destructive at another point in your life can start to feel like long-lost friends beckoning you to return. Old addictions, old temptations, old indulgences. That listen, God has already given you victory over. They can suddenly show up again with new powerful temptation in another season of life. It's spiritual amnesia all over again. And it wants you to forget what life was really like back there. It's a distorted reality, right? Those are the things that were destroying you, friends. It's a facade. It's an illusion. And so we start thinking things like, man, if I could just have one more hit, that was so great, right? Because all we remember is the high. We don't remember all the destruction in our lives. We just remember how good it felt for a moment to be in that illicit relationship before our family fell apart. And those sins are ever working to try and bury the memory of the destruction and the misery and the bondage and the the wreckage the sin brings into your life. They try to allure you back into their entrapments, telling you that 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 was the good life. That's why the Lord built in this reminder of bitter herbs to help the Israelites remember how miserable life really was in Egypt under Pharaoh. Eat the bitter herbs. Remember how bad sin really is and cast it out, friends. Do not bring it forward with you. Leave it behind. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, then, is a reminder for all of us that holiness matters to God. And sanctification is not an option for any of us. You were saved for more than just escaping eternal damnation. You were saved to be holy. You were saved to be sanctified, set apart unto the Lord. Therefore, we must continually forsake this life In our exile, the the life that leads us away from the presence and the knowledge of God, the life that is ultimately leading us back to our own miserable slavery. And, And so I just have to ask you this morning, what sin are you carrying with you from your own days in exile? Friends, the Lord wants you to respond and to be personally holy in that area of your life. Teens, I want you to know this. I want you to hear this from me today. Your sexual purity is not a minor issue to the Lord. It doesn't mean he's going to, he won't forgive you if you fail. He certainly will. But it does mean this. His anger is real. His discipline is real. 
The dangers of that sin are very, very real, and it will leave its mark in your life. And adults of all ages, it's no different for us, is it? The dangers of sexual sin are real. God takes that seriously, just like God takes your addiction seriously, just, God, just like God takes your doubt seriously, just like God takes your drunkenness seriously, and your worry, and your gossip, and your anger, and your complaining. God takes sin seriously. And listen to me, this is the will of God, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. Your sanctification. We're always asking, what's God's will for me? Here it is. Be holy. Be set apart. Be sanctified. He wants you to grow in this. He wants you to leave those sins behind once and for all and live a new sanctified life in the power of his resurrection, the power of his gospel. He wants you to take this just as seriously as he does by rooting out every last remnant of leaven that exists in your life and expel it once and for all. Get rid of the sin. I've shared this quote with you before, but I don't know any better way to say it than just repeating it again. The words of the Puritan writer John Owen, be killing sin or sin will be killing you, loved ones. And if you're sitting there thinking of that today, but, but how do I do that? I want to do that. The, the, the spirit is willing, but like the disciples said, but the flesh is weak, right? John, how do I purge my life of the sin that so easily besets me and has for so long? Here's the game plan. You ready? Last point this morning, my redemption calls for me to choose to remember what I should never forget, eradicate what I should never keep, and finally, worship who I should never forsake. To worship Christ more than I worship myself and the idols in my life, those sinful strongholds, to remove the idols that I'm bowing down to and give my full homage to Christ alone, to put him back in his place of proper authority in the throne room of my heart, and that's going to involve the same three things in my life and yours that it did for Israel. First of all, confess your sins daily, brothers and sisters. Confess your sins to him and ask for his help to not only cast out the sin, but to see the beauty of his holiness more clearly in your gaze, which is worship. That's what worship is. Worship him and the beauty of holiness. That's exactly what Israel did. Look at the end of verse 27 after hearing all these instructions. How does it say they responded? First, it says the, the people bowed their heads. See that? They bowed in recognition of their own sinfulness and total unworthiness. That's confession. And then secondly, look, it says they worshiped, right? So number two, worship God continually. Search the scriptures daily to learn more and more about the holy character of the one who is calling you to follow him in holiness and give him praise for what you know, what you learn about him, to be true of him. It has a purifying effect in your life. If you're struggling with sin, you need to know your God better. Knowing God has a way of making us hate sin in our lives. It makes us aware of its corrupting influence as we raise the bar of our own understanding for who our God is as revealed in his holy word. And then last, obey God immediately. And if that didn't go so well for you yesterday, start over again with confession and worship and a deliberate choice to obey God again today, right? Confess, worship, and obey. Confess, worship, and obey. Put it on repeat every day. That's exactly what Israel did in verse 28. The people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. See that? God's redemption calls for our response. And that response involves choosing to remember what I should never forget, eradicate what I should never keep, and worship who I should never forsake. Father, thank you that we could be here under the preaching of your word today. I thank you for these dear ones sitting in front of me, the precious souls that they represent that are precious in your sight. I thank you that you've made provision in Jesus Christ for all that is needed for our eternal security, but also for the daily struggle that we have with sin in our lives. Jesus is the answer. The gospel of Christ, the, the acknowledgement that I'm a great sinner, that Jesus is a great savior, and that I need him to, to save me from not just my eternal crisis uh, against hell, but also in every other subsequent crisis I face. Lord, we need you. We need you in exponentially more ways than we could ever imagine. And we never want to forget the power of the gospel that is at our disposal. So I pray for the weak one today, the, the one wallowing in sin, the one under great conviction even now. I pray that they would take seriously the opportunity to confess to worship, and to rise back up again and obey what you have said.
grant us your favor now as we move into this additional time of reflecting on your sacrifice on the cross. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close today by partaking together of the Lord's Supper. It's a wonderful day to do that as we've been able to study uh, some of the origins of that, even in Exodus, right? And so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ yourself, then we would uh, invite you this morning to partake at the table with us, whether you're a regular part of Keystone or not, even if you're our guest. All believers are welcome at the table. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're not a, a believer, maybe you'd say, I don't know if I am. Or maybe you would say, I know that I'm not, right? Wherever you're at in that, in that continuum, we would just ask that you sit this out, okay? Just let this happen all around you and know that we're not going to point you out. Nobody's in the back, like, accounting for who participated and who didn't. But we take seriously the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians regarding the warnings associated with what we are doing here today. And we would not want you for a moment to be fooled into thinking that eating a little piece of bread and drinking a little cup of juice does anything for you if you're not a Christian, right? It doesn't help you in any small way. It doesn't help you have a better week this week or put you in a better standing with God. And so we would just ask for you to sit there and think about God's call in your life to become a child of God. And church family, I want to remind you that as we do this together, this is a spiritual moment of remembrance, right? Just as we saw in Exodus, the memories that we celebrate around this table have been replaced, or they are the replacement for the Old Testament Passover that the saints observed for so long in the Old Testament. And so as we do this together, I tell you this often, let's be careful not to mock the very thing that we're remembering together, okay? We're remembering that the power of sin has been broken in our lives by the cross. And so if there are remaining patterns of unconfessed sin still present in our lives, deal with those first, okay? Kill sin or it will be killing you. And then also remember that the cross has made us the one people of God. It, it unified us together, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And we will worship our Lord together as one unified community forever. And so if there's disunity in here among God's people today, then let's repent of that fact and let's choose to be peacemakers. Do not mock the cross in this moment of remembrance by harboring unconfessed sin. And do not mock the cross by continuing to foster broken relationships that are within your reach to reconcile. Okay? Be very, very careful not to partake of the Lord's Supper while mocking the cross with your life. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty considering the, uh, concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Okay, so the worship team is going to come at this time. They're going to lead us in, in a song, and I'm going to invite you to get up from your place. The men will be spread around the room to distribute the elements, and so go quickly to those places and uh, grab those elements. But when you get back to your seat, just pause there for a moment and pray, okay? Remember, confess, worship, do not mock the cross. And after a few moments of that, we will partake together of the Lord's Supper. Okay, let's stand together and we'll go.